it's been lovely to be back with some old friends, not just locality, but a lot of the community organisations that I've worked with over the years who are doing such incredible things in the communities. This is a really tough time for many people, and these organisations really are the light on the hill for people in very dark times. It is genuinely brilliant to be here with you today and to be here with Locality, one of my favourite organisations who were pushing this agenda long became, before it became fashionable, long before it was appropriated into political slogans, long before it became very central to a debate about how we harness the power of people in every part of the country around that very, very important notion of place in order to build better as a country. And as I was driving into Sheffield, I was thinking the storm clouds were gathering, literally, um, but they're also gathering metaphorically because we're staring down the barrel of the hardest winter that most people can imagine. It was 50 years ago that Bobby Kennedy said that there's another kind of violence more deadly, destructive than the bomb or the shot in the night. This is the slow destruction of a child by hunger and schools without books and homes without heat in the winter. And for many, many people across this country, that is the reality of the state that the country is in. It's not just families bearing the brunt, there are businesses, people running small businesses across the country lying awake at night wondering how they're going to make ends meet. There are councils, charities, people who work in the National Health Service and, as you know, community organisations wondering what's going to happen when the grant funding comes to an end and the contract is up for renewal. And when those things fall apart, it's not just the service that goes. It's the staff member, that one individual who holds on to people at times of crisis, that relationship that is gold, that is fundamentally broken and lost. It's damage that cannot be recreated and it's damage that I know many of you in this room right now will be grappling with, wondering how it is that you can avoid that scenario. And there's an immediate cause to some of this crisis. We had a budget, a mini budget, as it was billed a few weeks ago that crashed the economy, sent interest rates soaring and mortgage payments through the roof and exacerbated the homelessness crisis. But actually, the reality is that the roots of the current malaise that Britain is in stretch back decades. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Because the foundations of a decent, secure life have been slowly eroded, not for some people now in Britain, but for most people in Britain. We have an economy that we work hard for every single day, but doesn't work for most of us where the contribution of most people and most parts of Britain has not just been written off, but has been written out of our national story. So in many towns across the country, like mine in Wigan, young people too often have to get out to get on. And they take with them the spending power that once sustained our pubs and our banks and our post offices and our high streets the things that make up the social fabric of a place. So people are left to grow old, hundreds of miles from children and grandchildren, families split apart by a settlement that writes off most of the assets and potential in our country. And where do those young people go to, like me, many years ago, 20 years ago, I moved from Lancashire to London to look for better incomes and better opportunities, and I found them. But I also found the higher housing costs. Now, young people in London pay out 60% of their disposable income in housing costs, and many of them just simply can't afford it. And the air pollution and the congestion and the huge extremes of poverty and wealth that come from trying to cram more and more people into small corners of the country because we haven't recognised the potential that exists everywhere else. One of uh, the great economists, British economist Diane Coyle says it's like trying to, trying to power a modern economy using only a handful of people in a small number of sectors in one small corner of the country is the equivalent of trying to fly a jet on only one engine. And I was asked the other day why the next Labour government will succeed in the regeneration agenda, the regional agenda, the localism agenda, call it what you like. There's been a hundred years of attempts and promises at doing something about this problem in Britain, and all of them, without exception, have ultimately failed. But the reason that this is different, 
I believe, is because Keir and Rachel and I don't see this as a local or regional problem. We see this at the heart of Britain's national crisis. We cannot continue to write most people off. We cannot continue to ignore the potential in most places. And we cannot continue to treat people as if they have no stake in the outcome and no skin in the game. I firmly believe that is the reason why we've seen these huge waves of political upheaval across every part of the United Kingdom in the last decade. Because people in a representative democracy who don't feel represented, that is a very serious thing indeed. And I still think that it's not well understood in Westminster and Whitehall how close the whole political system has come to collapse in recent years. People who have a stake in the outcome and skin in the game deserve the respect, dignity and power to be able to deliver on the country we know that we can be. So that is my mission and that will be our mission in government. Because... We can't continue to try and play the game of football, to use a well-used analogy, with only a couple of players on the pitch. You can't put most of your country on the bench and think that the country can succeed. You can't go on with a manager or a government that thinks that it can back only some of its players and bet the house on the stars and leave everybody else out of the game. Growth is the only way out of our current malaise, but the only route back to growth is to get every part of our country, all people and all places, able to make a contribution again, the contribution that is part of our civic inheritance, that we deserve as a right and a demand, not a gift to be given, and get Britain firing on all cylinders again. It was 50 years ago this year that the great trade unionist, Scottish trade unionist, Jimmy Reid, went to Glasgow University to make a speech that could have been made yesterday. It was called Alienation, and it echoed down the decades that followed. Jimmy Reid said, I am convinced that the great mass of our people go through life without even a glimmer of what they could have contributed. That is not just a personal tragedy, it is a social crime. Well, he was right. It is a social crime, and we're going to do things differently. So Keir has been clear that our mission is to get growth back into the economy, and we have a vision for how to do that. By ev giving every community in this country the power, the resources, and the backing to make the contribution that they know that they can make if they had a government that was able to match the level of ambition that they have for their families, their communities, and their country. The proceeds of growth have to be spread fairly, of course they do, and that hasn't happened in Britain for a very long time. But there's no point in arguing for people and communities and public services to be just the beneficiaries of growth if that growth isn't generated in the first place. And we know that the only way to do this is to get power into the right hands so that every penny that is spent is spent well and spent wisely, and powers to make decisions back to people who understand not just the problems in their communities, but the potential, the assets, and the way to create sustainable places. There's a really good example of this that I drove past on the way here in Rotherham, which I've visited a number of times over the years. Advanced manufacturing is one of the great British success stories, and it's sitting right there, just down the road. But why is it there? It's there because over a decade ago, the Regional Development Agency, led by a man called Tom Riordan, who is now the Chief Executive of Leeds City Council, understood that there was a legacy of skills in Sheffield and in Rotherham from the steel cutting industry. Why? Because his granddad worked in the steel industry. And he started to look at the assets and the potential in this area. One of the best universities in the country, one of the best universities in the world in Sheffield University. And all these dynamic businesses and entrepreneurs that were investing and creating in their hometown, their place, in it for the long haul, with a stake in the outcome and skin in the game. And he took a punt 
on advanced manufacturing because those skills that exist in steel cutting are directly transferable to the advanced manufacturing agenda. And he put backing and investment and financial power behind that vision, using the convening power of place to bring people together. The state didn't do it all, of course it didn't, but what the state did was play its part in laying the groundwork so that other people real people could come in and invest and build and create. Now, we believe that every part of Britain deserves that sort of future, deserves the right to make that sort of contribution again. And so when Ed Miliband talks about our climate investment pledge, £28 billion a year, every year, for a decade, invested into communities across Britain, that's because we've seen the potential in wind in Grimsby and in, um, in hydrogen in Ellesmere Port, to get money back into people's pockets, get young people into those incredible jobs with pride and purpose and a sense of contribution so that they can power us through the next century like their parents and grandparents powered us through the last. Forget the lick of paint on the high street and the small grant handed out Hunger Games style from Westminster by a junior minister who has never set foot in the places we call home. Our high streets will be thriving because our local economies will be thriving, every part of Britain making a contribution again. And what, what all this is based on is the idea that the real wealth creators, the real builders, are people. The greatest asset that Britain has. That's why we're going to tilt the balance of power back to you, people with a stake in the outcome and skin in the game. And that starts, of course, with political leaders. We believe in government arrangements that reflect the local needs and realities of geography and identity and economics. And it offends me beyond measure that a child in Bolton has the right to get on a bus that can take him or her to an apprenticeship because Andy Burnham has been granted powers in Greater Manchester that are denied to a child in Barnsley because a chancellor has decided that Oliver Coppard is not granted the same. So our offer will be, come to us and tell us what powers you need, and they will be on offer to all, not some. You decide your own government's arrangements, because in any democracy worth its salt, people have to consent to their own governance. And whether it's a hotel bedroom tax in Birmingham or Manchester, whether it's investment in skills and the powers to decide the investment in skills in Stoke, or control over buses in Grimsby, our only stipulation is that local leaders will need to be accountable and transparent to their community, something that has been completely absent from the debate over the last 12 years and needs to be restored to the heart of that thinking. But we won't stop there, and I was listening to Andy just as I came in earlier, and he's right that powers pushed down simply to political leaders are not powers to people and that it's people in communities that build and create and invest. That's why we've promised to create a powerful new community right to buy, so that you don't just have the right to bid for assets of community value, the pubs, the buildings, the football clubs, the live music venues that make up the social fabric of the place you call home, but you have first refusal when they come up for sale. And when long-term vacant high street property becomes available, you'll have the right to buy it without competition and the right to force a sale of land or buildings in a state of significant disrepair. Because too often, powers and rights on paper don't translate into meaningful change for lack of resources. I saw this with my own football club, Wigan Athletic, when it collapsed. We were given the right to buy it, but only if we could find a cool £16 million down the back of a sofa in a town where average earnings lag way behind the national average. Rights are useless without the means to enforce them. So we're going to build on the community ownership fund to ensure every community has a fund to draw on, including doubling the length of time you have to raise money from six months to 12. And in the summer, I established a commission led by Mark Gregory, the former chief economist of Ernst & Young, to work with community organisations across the country to make good on these plans. And I'm pleased to say that he's already uh, hard at work. This is the first step on the road to greater financial autonomy for our towns, our villages and our cities. 
because I've seen what this can do in action. In Hendon, in Sunderland, a group of residents had watched as private landlords had bought up housing stock, letting standards collapse, pushing up rents and running down the community. They were using a loophole in the law that allows you to claim inflated rates of housing benefit for supported accommodation and then provide no support to people who need it at all. Nobody checks, nobody defines what support is and whole communities left to go to rack and ruin. But in Hendon, they showed how things can be different. This incredible group of women uh, used a grant from a scheme introduced by the last Labour government, since abandoned by this government, and took back control, buying up properties, doing them up, and letting them out to local families in good condition. The revenue that they've generated has allowed them to bring the historic library in the centre of Hendon back into use, and it's changed lives, investing in young people across their community. They call themselves back on the map in recognition of how much they've contributed and how much they still have to offer. And that's why we will make sure that when those people, the builders, the creators, the investors, when those people are going about their business trying to build the future of this country, instead of banging up against the system, they will feel the whole system pulling in behind them, driving the future of their own communities, including and I'll say to you today, the power to buy land at, at, at cost value in order to shape and drive the future of the communities that they live in. Existing use value that prevents profit being extracted from land and th those town centres, those places that we call home, being allowed to go to rack and ruin. Because this is a collective endeavour, they say, the government say, you can grow this country but by the few, for the few, we say it takes a nation. And we move forward from a system that has no longer served us, has not served us for a very long time, in one of the most centralised countries in the world, where the contribution of most people has been written out and written off, to reimagine what the state means in this new era, smash up that centrally of centralisation and put power back in the hands of people who are already rebuilding our country, one community at a time. And I'll finally just say this, we do this not because... We want to, although I do, but because we have to. Because it's only by putting people in charge that we're going to defeat the great challenges of our age. Of an ageing population and climate change, an energy revolution that will leave no part of Britain untouched. This is how we'll usher in a new era of national regeneration, restore trust in our political institutions and rebuild bridges across our fractured nation. Now, you might be... You might be forgiven for thinking that you've heard some of this before. All oppositions talk about devolution. Governments seldom do it. It's tempting once you get into government and you're handed the levers of power to just pull power back to the centre. But I want to say to you that from the time that I went and did my first job as a, working with homeless teenagers at the charity Centre Point, where they taught me, those amazing inspirational kids taught me, that states don't change things, people do. And it's only when the state pulls in behind them and gives the tools that they need to build that lives can change, and they did. As a young councillor in Hammersmith, negotiating hot-button issues like homeless shelters and parking permits, or as the shadow foreign secretary sitting with leaders from Israel and Palestine to try to negotiate peace. I have learned that the only change that lasts is when the future is negotiated, not imposed. And so we're going to rise to meet the challenge of our age, to rebuild our country to the country we know it can be. It's going to take every single person in this room and outside of these four walls. We're going to do it, and we're going to do it the only way that counts, which is together. Thank you. <laughs>